Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us to Spring Guardian for a Healthy Yard and Watershed. My name is Nicole Biaggi, and I am the Outdoor Educator for the Wild Rivers Conservancy of the St. Croix and Namakati. I'm Jen Lutz, the Business Manager for Wild Rivers Conservancy. The Conservancy is the official nonprofit partner of the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway, which is a unit of the National Park Service. The Conservancy mission is to inspire stewardship to forever ensure the rare ecological integrity of the St. Croix and Namakagan Riverway. As a nonprofit, we depend on the support of individuals and businesses throughout the watershed to carry out our important mission. If you are inspired by our work today, please consider becoming a member, volunteering, or participating in one of our many upcoming events. And for those of you who are already supporters, thank you. So before we begin, we would like to take a few moments to talk housekeeping. To ensure the best video quality, please keep your camera off and remain on mute. You can type questions at any time in the chat, and after the presentation, there will be time for Angie to answer your questions. This program will be recorded and a link will be sent out in the next few days. The recording will also be available on to view on the Conservancy's YouTube channel. So today's topic is spring gardening for a healthy yard and watershed. Our presenter today is Angie Hong. Angie coordinates the East Metro Water Resource Education Program, a local government partnership hosted by the Washington Conservation District with 30 members. She holds a Master of Science degree in Natural Resources, Science and Management with an emphasis on environmental education from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and a Bachelor of Science in Zoology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Please read her tips and tales about keeping water clean at www.eastmetrowater.org. Please join us in welcoming Angie. Hi, thank you. Well, um, it's wonderful to see the names of people. It's, um, I'll still never get used to not seeing a group of faces when it's time to give a presentation doing these on Zoom. But from where I'm sitting, my vantage point, I can see out the window. I was talking about the fat squirrel that I was watching on my fence post and there's sunshine coming in. So um, those are both really great signs of spring. I'm wondering if all of you using your little chat feature, um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, wanna start sharing some of the signs of spring that you have been seeing in the past week because I feel like in the past week, that's when things have really started to get moving. Uh, so go ahead and drop a, drop a note in the chat there. Um, some of the things that I start seeing very early in the spring are included in this slide. This is just to get your, get your mind working about those beautiful little signs of spring. And um, if you are lucky, you might even start seeing the colored green right now, even in the snow. Uh, I've got a picture on the top of these crazy lichens that I found in Door County last week. It was just covered in ice, um, frozen waves from Lake Michigan, and there in, you know, and the edge of the lake were these nice little green lichens, and I believe this is in the pixie cup family. If anybody came to the Lunch and Learn last month with Joe Waleski all about lichens, that was really, really fun. Um, let's see, what, what do we got coming in here? Um, a fly! <laughs> Water running and melting. My backyard is a lake right now, um, almost a literal lake. Uh, geese returning to Long Lake. Oh, Tennessee. Oh man, you're already getting bunnies. Wow. Canadian geese. Um, I just heard a, heard a sandhill crane going overhead this morning. So that was pretty cool. Troll hoggins closing, tapping maple trees. Sand hill cranes, lots of sand hill cranes, swans and puddles. Oh, a tiny skunk. Oh, how cute. Oh, that must've been super cute. Um, so a couple of other early spring things that you might start to see in this upper left-hand corner, this red thing looks like a flower. It is actually a fungus. It's uh, called a scarlet cap a mushroom. And you'll find them, they're one of the first brightly colored things that you start finding after the snow melts. So that's something that you can be on the lookout for. And then likewise, down in the bottom right-hand corner, there's this really cool star-shaped 
thing that I have a picture of. This was a new find for me last year. I was hiking at um, St. Croix Bluff Scientific Natural Area and I stopped and said, oh my gosh, what is this flower? I've never seen a star-shaped flower in Minnesota before. What on earth could this be? So I took a picture. Um, a lot of you might be familiar with iNaturalist. Took a picture, looked it up on iNaturalist, found out it was not a flower. It's called a hydroscopic earth star. And it is kind of like the puffball mushrooms that, you know, puff and break open. That's why there's that little break down the middle when the spores come out. Um, but I found that right around late March, early April. Um, and we're still a little ways off from when we get to see the spring ephemerals, but pretty soon the spring ephemerals will start popping too. So those are all exciting things to look forward to. Um, so I am going to talk about creating, uh, I'll skip this because we already did an intro of who I am. I'm going to talk a bit about creating a wildlife friendly yard in general, but um, make sure to end up with some good recommendations for spring in particular. My office is hosted at the Washington Conservation District. So it is a countywide local unit of government. We, for anybody who's lucky enough to live in Washington County who's listening today, we offer free site visits for any landowners in Washington County, whether you own a farm, a business, a home, live in an apartment, um, and can talk through potential landscaping projects that you might want to do and help connect you with any grants that are available. Um, there are a lot of cost share grants available through our watershed districts for projects that help to improve um, water quality and Washington County, Minnesota. Yes, good question. Um, Washington County, Minnesota. It's funny because I went to high school in Washington County, Wisconsin, and now I live in Washington County, Minnesota. Um, and then we, we also host workshops throughout the year on a variety of different topics. Um, so I did, I put the website, um, I'm going to type it in the chat right now while I'm talking, because if you live in Washington County and wanted to request a free site visit, there's a link to do so on our website. So um, that's a great way to kick things off if you are planning a spring landscaping project or hoping to be planning a spring landscaping project. Um, we in Minnesota have something kind of unique that doesn't exist in Wisconsin, which are watershed management organizations. The, sorry, the majority of them um, in Washington County are watershed districts. So they're kind of like school districts. They are able to levy property taxes and then they do work to protect water quality and prevent against flooding. So we have eight watershed entities in Washington County, and then um, we have recently, in the past year, formed a larger partnership with governmental entities in four other counties. So we now have on the Minnesota side of the river, the Lower St. Croix Watershed Partnership, and you can see the blue outline of where that is, that we are all working together and have Minnesota state grant funds coming in that we are putting towards projects that help to um, reduce water pollution and protect the lakes, rivers, and streams in, um, in the Lower St. Croix watershed. So I am going to be talking specifically about spring gardening for a healthy yard and watershed going to start by talking about wildlife needs, um, some of the trees and shrubs that you can select for your yard for birds and pollinators, uh, pollinator friendly gardens. This has been a top popular topic in the past five to 10 years. Cues for care to give your native gardens better curb appeal. Um, I mentioned that I would talk about some spring gardening tips, do's and don'ts, and then end with resources to help you get started on projects that you might be wanting to do this spring and summer. Uh, so just thinking about wildlife needs, um, this is going way back in time to grade school when you learned about what does an animal need, you know, an animal needs food, an animal needs water, they need shelter, they need space. And then think about what our typical residential landscapes look like. So option one, um, you are a monarch in France and you have your castle and you have your enormous lawn. Um, you probably aren't actually a monarch in France, but a lot of our residential landscapes in suburban areas in particular are modeled after that 
European nobility idea of having this just endless lawn. Um, even if you shrink that down to a typical residential landscape with a subdivision house and a mostly green lawn, that's really not offering wildlife anything. Um, you know, it's not offering food, not offering water, not offering shelter, maybe offering a little space. Um, thinking of things that we can do to improve that situation. In the second picture, we have a what is called a bee-friendly lawn. So this is where you might maintain the look of having a lawn with low-growing plants, but we're going to bring in some clover. We're going to bring in some creeping thyme, some self-heal, some flowering plants that are going to provide nectar for bees and other pollinating insects. So that's going to help a little. Um, you know, picture number three, this is, we're going to step it up a little bit. <laughs> we're going to intentionally create a natural space in our yard using native plants that are native to our region, and they are going to provide the food and the shelter for the insects, for the birds, even for some of the small mammals that we want to support. Um, option four, this is probably only practical if you are somebody who has a large property, um, you know, but option four is really, you're just going completely natural. So if you were somebody who owned 10 acres of land, you might only be landscaping the portion that's closest to your house and then working with your local conservation district or land and water conservation department to restore the rest of your property into natural habitat. So those are, you know, you can kind of think of it as a spectrum and think about where you might land on that spectrum. Um, so thinking about trees and shrubs for birds and pollinators, and I like to start with trees first or trees and shrubs first because they are the foundation really for what you might think of as a micro habitat in your yard. Um, a lot of times people jump straight to thinking about the flowers, but we wanna have some kind of anchor in there too, some kind of tree or shrub. And that's really where um, the bulk of the habitat value is gonna come from for most of the species we wanna, we wanna support. Thinking of the St. Croix River Valley, St. Croix River watershed in particular, 320 species of birds live in the area. And of those 60 are considered species of greatest conservation need. So because there's a riverway coming through here, there is, it creates a migratory corridor. The Mississippi is also a migratory corridor. And we get a lot of birds coming through during the spring, during the fall, a lot of seasonal migrants and a lot of birds that stay throughout the year because there are these constant water sources and food sources for them. Um, in Minnesota, there are 146 species of butterflies. Did you know that? <laughs> You probably recognize, you know, three, maybe five species of butterflies, but there's actually 146 species that live in Minnesota. I don't know the number off the top of my head from Wisconsin. Um, but, you know, what's unfortunate is that a lot of these bird and um, insect species are declining. So you've probably heard about monarch butterflies, for example, declining rapidly um, since the 1990s until now, you know, we have good years and bad years, but overall the uh, populations have been going down. So there's been a really big effort in recent, um, you know, the recent decade, two decades to get more habitat here and more habitat down in Mexico where they are overwintering. Um, so there was some really great research from a professor in Connecticut, Doug Tellamy, who looked at the value of different kinds of plants, trees, shrubs, and you know, flowering plants in terms of how many insects they would attract. And what he discovered is that um, you, know, you might not think you want to bring bugs into your yard, but birds usually need to eat bugs during the summertime, during, um, you know, besides for the ones that are overwintering and eating seeds and nuts, the ones that come back in the summertime are looking for insects to eat. And so by bringing in um, these kind of like high value native trees, native shrubs, native plants, we bring in the insects that then brings in the birds. So it's, you know, it's all just um, a food chain really that we're creating. So some of the trees and shrubs that you could consider putting in your yard, and this is just kind of going to be a, a rapid fire list that I'm going through here. Hackberry, nannyberry, 
Pagoda dogwood. These are all small ones. These are all kind of shrub sized ones. Pagoda dogwood is one that grows in the shade. So this is a great option if you have a spot that doesn't have full sun and you're a little worried about a shrub being able to get started. Uh, hazelnut, hawthorn. I wanted to stop on hawthorn. This is one that's in my yard because I feel like this is a great one throughout the year. And it's not one that I see a lot of people promoting or um, utilizing in their gardens. As you can see in the left-hand picture, it gets really pretty flowers in the spring, gets lots of bees on it. And then I also think it looks really pretty in the winter because it has these really pretty red berries and I have birds all over mine even now. Um, it also has really pretty fall color. So it's a, it's a nice all around kind of one. Wild plum is another one, um, especially these trees that get the flowers in the spring are really important for the pollinators because a lot of our lower growing flowers aren't flowering yet. So that's where they're getting their nectar from in the spring. Um, red osier dogwood, black cherry, white pine, and red maple. And then here we go, white oak. Um, when uh, Professor Tellamy did his research, he discovered that these white oak support more than 500 different species of larval insects, which like I said, sounds kind of creepy until you realize it's like a buffet for the birds. Um, so white oaks are really an anchor species, especially in, um, you know, where, where we are in Washington County, the native habitat was mostly oak savanna, not pine forest. So, um, you know, a white oak or a burr oak is really kind of an anchor species in our area. Very slow growing though. So, um, you know, looking for some of those shrubs if you want to have more instant thing appeal. Um, so pollinator beneficial trees and shrubs. This is just, you know, a little bit longer list. I showed you pictures of several of these, but all of these ones are good ones to provide early foraging for bees and pollinators. All right. Um, so then talking about pollinator friendly gardens next. Um, and there is a little video clip here. We uh, work with all sorts of private landscaping companies, our office, we're government. So we don't actually do projects for people. We just help them to find the resources to do them. Um, and I will share at the end a list of multiple native plant retailers and landscaping companies that you can work with. But one of these companies put together what I thought was a really great video just showing how um, you know, little things that we do in our yards can add up to a big difference and why that's important. So I thought it was a cute enough, short enough video that I wanted to play it for you right now.
Okay. Let's see if I can successfully get out of here. It seems like every time I get into the um, I get into the video, then I somehow like can't get myself to the next slide. There we go. Okay. Um, I saw a thing jump up on the. Yes, love this concept. I did too. I just <laughs> when I saw their video, I was like, this is so cute. I'm going to use this in my presentations because I just love the idea of a packet furry and how it can be so um, so simple and so easy. Uh, in Minnesota, we recently designated the Rusty Patch Bumblebee as our new Minnesota State Bee, which is kind of a fun thing. We never previously had a Minnesota State Bee. Um, but unfortunately, the reason that it got designated is because it was also listed as a federally endangered species. So there has been a huge effort statewide to work with people on improving and creating new pollinator habitat with an emphasis on supporting the rusty patch bumblebee as kind of a, um, you know, a signifying insight or a signifying symbol of um, all the other species that could be protected by having more, more habitat. So the bumblebees, they need nests in the ground. So they are not actually ones that are living in a colony like the way a honeybee does. Um, most of our native bee insects actually do either nest in the ground or they nest in stems and, um, you know, like stems of dried plants. They need blooming native flowers throughout the growing season. Um, they become active in April and stay active until October, need connected high quality habitat and protection from insecticides and fungicides. So I mentioned that these are just one of the native bee species that we have in the area. This is the different places where the rusty patch bumblebee is still found in the upper Midwest in Minnesota and Wisconsin in particular. There's a lot of places where it's still found. And then over on the right hand side, this is a map of Washington County in some areas where we know that they are still living. But they are just one of the native bee species that we have in Minnesota. So only 1.4% of the over 3,600 known US bee species are bumblebees. And there's all these other kinds of bees. And the majority of bees are solitary insects. Or if they live in a group, they live in just a very small family group, not in a huge colony the way you think of with yellow jacket wasps or honeybees. Um, so all sorts of different kinds of bees. Uh, some of them, like if you look at this green sweat bee, they almost look like a fly. Sometimes you could confuse them for being a fly. They're very small, they can be very big. And they will even uh, have different kinds of native plants that they specialize in. So I wish I used to have all my books sitting right here at my fingertips and I moved them just 10 feet away. Um, Heather Holm has written some really great books where she correlated different bee species with different kinds of native plants which ones they would use for foraging. Um, but you know, really the, the important thing I'm wanting you to take away from this is that we really do have to have specific kinds of native plants in our yard. It's not enough to just have pretty plants. Um, we can also have pretty plants, but if you have just things like peonies and tulips, um, you know, non-native roses, these are all things that I do have in my yard, but if you only have that, then it's not gonna provide the nectar that we need for our native insects. Um, this is just showing what the native pre-settlement habitat was like in the Twin Cities metro area. And I said that in our area, we were mostly oak savanna, um, prairie and oak savanna. And then as you get out into Western Twin Cities area, that's more where you start to find the big woods with the maples and the basswood trees. But we've lost most of that. So when we're looking at remaining intact native plant communities, it is along the riverways and in some of these, you know, wetland Anoka sand plain patches where they weren't able to develop. And the most of the rest of it has been lost to farming and to urban development. So that's why it's really, really important for us to think of how we can use our yards as a way to help recreate these um, patches and corridors of habitat that we've lost over time. 
So just showing you an example or a few examples of what this can look like. We have um, some maps from Metro Blooms that is the host for the Blue Thumb Planting for Clean Water program. And they looked at in, in the first map here on the left side, where there's existing known high quality habitat in Minneapolis. So like I said, it's you know, mostly along the riverway, mostly along the lakes in those few places where it's protected and undeveloped. Um, and then the next, the middle map is showing a 200 meter buffer around each of those high quality habitats. So that was based just on you know, the distance a small pollinator could fly. So you can see it can, you know, a small pollinator could almost make it along the length of the Mississippi Riverway and almost make it around the chain of lakes, but there's gonna be some gaps. Um, then in this last map, they added in all the people who have come to Metro Bloom's workshops and gone on to plant rain gardens or native gardens in their yards. And once you add all of those people in, we really add a lot more connected habitat, especially when we're talking about birds and pollinators. It's not going to be enough for a moose, but um, for a bird or a pollinator, it's going to be enough that we can start to recreate habitat. Um, likewise, in Washington County, we've looked at all the places that are kind of pollinator sweet spots. These are places where um, everywhere that's shown as green, where it's next to some high quality habitat and maybe it's low quality habitat currently, but it could be improved and become high quality habitat. And you can see in here too, how it would be really easy. Um, like there's this little call out box here. People who are living in these homes right here by planting native gardens in their yards could really increase the size of that habitat a quarter of that little habitat patch that's in that part of the county. So even though it might not feel like a native garden, just one in your yard can make that much of a difference, it really can. Uh, so just giving you some examples of plants that you can use in a pollinator friendly garden. And this is a lovely, lovely rain garden that uh, Master Gardener Bonnie Duran in Lake Elmo built about 10 years ago with our office. I used to always hoodwink her into having um, tours at her home and hosting garden parties. And um, we haven't been able to do that for the past couple of years. So that's been too bad. But some species that you could consider including in your yard specifically for the rusty patch bumblebee. Uh, wild bergamot, Virginia bluebells, goldenrod, blazing star. The blazing star are really great for butterflies also. Um, monarch butterflies, even though they can only lay their eggs on the milkweed, will use a whole variety of plants for nectar and they especially like the blazing star. Um, asters are good for fall, the giant hyssop, the columbine. Columbine is a good one for the spring, for having spring color, spring color and spring nectar. Um, and really, it's important with the rusty patch, but basically all of these insects that you have throughout the season, different kinds of blooms happening. So we don't want to just have flowers that look really great in July. We need to have some flowers that will be blooming in the spring, some in the summer, some in the late summer, some in the fall. So thinking about making sure you're selecting a few species that would you know, help to meet each of these categories. I'm um, sorry if the words on this are a little bit blurry, but what is happening at this time of year, if we use the Rusty Patch Bumblebee as an example, um, they are, right now, the queens have overwintered and they are getting ready to emerge and they will, um, you know, they will start laying eggs in the near future. And like I mentioned with the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, they are ground nesters. So one of the recommendations is to avoid raking or mowing in the early spring because a lot of these ground nesters are just going to be coming out. Um, it's really pretty damaging to your lawn as well if you're out there raking and mowing right after the snow has melted. Um, you know, but I'll talk a, in a little bit too about resisting the urge to cut down all the dry dead stems that are in your gardens if they're still up at this time of year because there are a lot of insects that are overwintering in those right now as well. Um, so I'm just gonna run through some species recommendations, looking at pretty flowers, getting us all in the mood for spring. Um, if you have a shady yard, so a lot of my yard is shady, 
Uh, there are still lots of great flowers that you can plant. And the nice thing about the shade yard or the shade gardens is they're gonna be the ones that actually look good in the spring. So that's gonna be the first place that you get to see pretty flowers in the spring. I mentioned columbine already, wild geranium's a nice one, um, ferns all sorts of ferns. There's so many different species of ferns that you could consider for your yard. And some of them will even start coming up right now into the snow. So um, that's nice. Culver's, Culver's root, fox sedge. There's a couple of other kinds of sedges you could consider also. Pen sedge is a nice one. Um, partial shade, partial sun. Some more options for things to look at. Um, this bottle gentian. I love these. They never, these are the ones down in the bottom corner that have the flower heads that are together and they never fully open up and they always stay closed up like that. But bumblebees are able to vibrate at just the right frequency that they kind of like get in there and they get in inside um, the flower and are able to get to the, the pollen and the nectar and then come back out again. And they're a late bloomer, the one that doesn't bloom until September, October. Full sun, the world is your oyster when you have full sun, lots of great um, flowering options. If you have been scared off by planting milkweed in the past because of common milkweed and how it spreads so easily, consider using butterfly milkweed. It is one that is adapted for prairies, dry conditions. It grows much shorter. It only grows to be maybe two at the most, three feet tall. Usually in my yard, it's more like two feet. And it doesn't spread the way the common milkweed does, but it still provides a host for the, um, for the monarch larva. So pretty orange flowers. Um, the anise hyssop. If you've ever um, smelled that before, it smells like black licorice. And I have some in my backyard. It's like bumblebee candy. Um, lots of purple, lots of purple, blazing star, asters, sunflowers, nice grasses um, that you can consider too, side oats grandma. I guess the only one that isn't native here is this Carl Forster feather reed grass, but it is a good, a good sturdy backdrop if you wanna have something to give your garden a little bit of structure. I lost my, there we go. Um, nope, I'm gonna skip that because that was fall. Um, <laughs> I forgot that the last time I was talking about this, I was giving fall recommendations for pretty fall color. Um, so Wild Ones is a native plant organization and they put together this really nice um, 10 by 10 native pocket prairie garden. So you could, you know, take a little screenshot of this if you wanted to be able to use this as a base. And it's nice because it gives you ideas of, you know, what's going to bloom in April, May, what's going to bloom in June or July, August, October, and where you should put it in the garden, depending on how short it's going to be or, or how tall it's going to be. So I thought this was a really nice, um, nice little starter suggestion. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about cues for care because another way that people have sometimes been scared off from using native plants in the past is by seeing gardens that are just really wild and woolly looking. And if you have a big yard, that's probably okay. You know, if you have 10 acres, you can get away with having a wild woolly native prairie in your yard and it will look lovely if you have a little one acre or I'm not one acre, if you have a little one eighth of an acre yard and you've got giant, um, you know, cup flower is one that I can think of that, you know, it's gonna spread all over the place, then that might not be as conducive. So one of the things that we tell people, if you create clean edges, that helps to make it look intentional and look like a garden in a way that um, might gain better social acceptance from your neighbors, you know, especially depending on what kind of neighborhood you live in. So things like having a cut edge or a brick edge or having the garden up against the sidewalk using rock boulders, things like this make it look like, yes, this is a garden. I didn't just get lazy and stop mowing my lawn one day. Um, mowed turf edges along streets and sidewalks can help to create edges as well. So in this example, this is a native garden, but if you look around all the edges, there is a turf strip before it gets to the sidewalk in the street. So this can also to help so that you don't have the deal with the tall plants getting linky and flapping over into the sidewalk in the late summer and the early fall. 
um, and not having to worry about blocking view corridors for people driving on the street. Um, walking paths, edges. Um, this is an example of one that, that is in Stillwater overlooking the beautiful St. Croix River. And they had existing landscaping that they built a rain garden to kind of blend in with. So where we're standing in the picture, we're standing in the driveway and then the water goes down through this little dry creek bed that they created with the rocks and goes into what is now a rain garden. Um, but they front, front loaded it with flowers. So there's lots of shrubs at the back. If it was just shrubs the whole way, it might look, you know, a little messy or, or unmaintained, but having the flowers on the front gives it the look of being more of a garden. Um, you know, just another example, this is a shoreline planting on Forest Lake. And they kind of use the same idea where they have a brick border along the lawn. So it looks very clean and very manicured. You know, and then it's allowed to get taller and looser as it gets close to the water. Um, but something else that they did in here is that they grouped the flowers together. So as opposed to taking the, um, you know, getting a bag of native seeds and just kind of sprinkling it everywhere, that looks great in a prairie. Most people don't end up liking the way that looks in a yard. So having things grouped together will help you with weeding and um, also help it to give just a little bit more clear defined. What are those tall purple ones? Um, these are a liatris that's that's back there in the background and that's um, liatris or blazing star. So that's one of those ones that the butterflies like a lot. Yeah, and thinking about, um, you know, another thing you can see in this photo, they chose shorter growing ones are closer to the house and then taller grow growing ones closer to the lake. You know, that just helps to create like a natural, um, natural step staircase so that you don't have the tall flowers in the front blocking the view of the short ones. Okay, um, so just an example from Stillwater Township. Uh, we had a property owner who contacted us a couple years ago and she had a pretty big yard. She had, um, you know, three acres, I believe, and had this whole area that was an acre in size. It was downhill going to this pond and you know, they, they didn't want to mow it. Um, it was steep slopes down at the bottom. It was really wet because basically it's going into a wetland and they just wanted ideas of what they could do. So uh, one of the landscape designers at our office worked with them and put together this, <laughs> which I think is 100 times better. Um, they basically took all of that mowed lawn out and it all got planted in native plants that are able to tolerate wet conditions. Um, and you can see kind of some of these same principles that the color is all closest to the house up at the top of the hill. Once you get down by where the pond is, I'm just gonna back up so you can see it used to be this very small pond and now they've let, whew, they've let the, wet, um, the wetland breathe a bit. It's kind of like after Thanksgiving dinner when you unbutton your jeans, it's like, whew, can let it out a little bit. And it's mostly just, you know, grasses and sedges down there at the bottom, but because there's lots of flowers up at the top, you know, it creates a nice aesthetically pleasing look, lots of habitat for birds, lots of habitat. They're out in the country, so lots of habitat for other kinds of animals as well. Um, so I just wanted to talk about some spring gardening do's and don'ts. Um, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but once the snow finally melts and you no longer have a lake in your yard and now you have um, a lawn, you really need to baby it kind of in the beginning of the spring and don't, don't be so, you know, so rushing to get out there and start raking or mowing or doing any of those other kinds of things. Most of the lawns are still soft. Um, raking can really easily create bare patches where now you have a, a seed bed for, or, you know, an open space for the weeds to start coming up. And even things like fertilizing, um, you don't want to fertilize in the spring because what it will do is encourage the grass to grow up really tall at the expense of putting energy into its roots. What you want your lawn to be doing in the spring is concentrating on growing nice, deep, thick roots, not uh, green grass blades. Uh, if you are fertilizing your lawn, the University of Minnesota Extension recommends right around Labor Day is the best time of year to be fertilizing. So the exact opposite of when you might be thinking you should do it. 
Um, these are some beautiful photos I took when we had that ice storm like a week and a half ago um, out in my yard. And I was talking about this earlier about resisting the temptation to cut down all of these plants that are still standing. Um, there are a lot of bees and beneficial insects that will overwinter. They either are overwintering themselves in a state of diapause or else they have laid eggs and the eggs are overwintering in the stems of plants. And then there are um, a lot of insects that are also overwintering underneath leaves that are down in our garden beds. And even not just insects, there can even be salamanders, frogs and toads, um, small mammals, things like that. So uh, the recommendation from Pollinator Friendly Alliance is to wait until the daytime temps are consistently above 50 degrees, which is nowhere near now, right? <laughs> it's like we have we have one warm day, um, you know, in, in my yard, I still have feet deep of snow, but um, you really have to wait a lot longer than you think you might before, before you could cut down the stems and rake the leaves out. If you get really, really, um, you just can't, you're anxious, you can't wait any longer on cutting down some of the, you know, the linky ugly standing dead plants, you could cut them down and just gather them really loosely in a bundle and lay them somewhere in the back part of your yard. Because if they do have the eggs and the baby bees in them, that will give those a chance to emerge and be able to come, you know, before you go and compost them or throw them away. So leave some for the bees. Um, we are coming up rapidly on April when it is no longer going to be safe to trim oak branches or dig near oak trees. Um, because of oak wilt, it's a fungal disease that kills thousands of oak trees every year. So just keep that in mind if you do have oak trees in your yard. And I put a website down here for University of Minnesota Extension. They have like an oak wilt risk level on that website. And so they will update that every couple of weeks to say, um, you know, is it safe to trim? Right now it is still safe to trim. So if you have anything that needs to be trimmed, do it now before we get into the, into the full spring. Um, this is not directly related to gardening. But this is something that you could and should be doing at this time of year. If you um, have <laughs> a neighborhood anything like mine, there is so much salt lying around right now because it's been crazy icy. Um, as a general rule of thumb, once the salt or once the ice is melted and the salt is sitting there, it's no longer doing anything. It's, now it's just sitting on the pavement. Um, and you could very easily just break it up be able to reuse it, um, you know, use it for, say, for next winter, reuse it the next time that you have ice that you need to cover up. You can even rake it up with it or sweep it up if it's out in the street, because honestly, nobody else is going to sweep it up. It's just going to end up going down the storm drains and end up in your nearby lakes and rivers. Um, this is a photo of Joe Nabley. He's a Minnesota water steward volunteer who has made this his mission to go around um, sweeping up leftover salt in his neighborhood. But we do have a pretty big growing problem with fluoride contamination in both Minnesota and Wisconsin. So um, every little bit helps. And on that topic, the other thing that you might start noticing in your neighborhood, if, especially if you have storm drains, is that they will look like this. As soon as that snow has melted enough, there's going to be this big pile of glue that is on top of the storm drains, um, lots of leaves and dirt and, you know, there's salt mixed in there. There's all sorts of stuff that we really don't want to have ending up in our lakes and rivers. So if you do have extra time, you know, go out there and clean up all that gook that's along your curb line and going into the storm drain just to keep it out of our lakes and rivers. And if you want to get, you know, extra credit for that, go to adopt a drain and you can actually just click on the storm drain closest to your house. This is only in Minnesota, not in Wisconsin, but you can click on the storm drain closest to your house and officially adopt it. We have had 17,000 storm drains adopted so far in Minnesota, mostly in the Twin Cities area. So a lot of people who are going out there and officially adopting their storm drains and saying, yes, I'm going to take care of them, um, you know, helps to keep the street looking nice, but also more importantly, helping to keep the lakes and the rivers clean. Um, so then lastly, just wanted to end with some resources to help you get started on 
projects that you may want to do in your yard. Um, the first one I mentioned earlier, a program partnership called Blue Thumb Planting for Clean Water. And this is 60 to 70 organizations that includes local government groups, nonprofit organizations, native plant nurseries, and native or landscape designers who specialize in working with native plants. Um, so they've all worked together over the past 10 to 15 years, created resources that are on the website. They host workshops together. We're part of the partnership too. Um, what is really cool though on the website is this plant selector tool. So if you go there and you're thinking, what can I grow in my yard? And you just enter in what your yard's characteristics are. So, you know, it's shady, it's wet. I want something that's red and I want it to bloom in June. Poof, and it will give you a list of native plants that all meet those criteria. So you can use that to help figure out what kinds of things to plant in your yard. There's also links to native plant suppliers and contractors. There's a few demo designs that you can use for native plantings and a lot of information about rain gardens, turf alternatives, things like that. Um, I mentioned earlier for anybody who's in Washington County that we do site visits. Um, and we do also have links to a lot of printable, like downloadable PDF resources, like the Blue Thumb Guide to Your Own Yard Care. That's a little booklet you can download as a PDF. Um, or we have slides and recordings from previous workshops that you can go and take a look at as well. Um, on the Blue Thumb website, and then also on the Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources Lawrence to Legumes website, they have this planting for pollinators guide. And what's really cool about it is that it has paint by number garden designs. So you can just go on there and say, oh, I've got a shady yard, but I wanna make a pollinator garden and use their little garden design. And it's just like, you know, just like paint by numbers that you stick the flowers in the places where the, you know, the design has been prescribed and be able to get yourself a nice, um, be able to get yourself a nice garden there. Say you have an established garden of native plants. How do you renew the earth under them, keeping the soil in good condition? Um, so like you're thinking you've already got native plants. You, so there, I, so there's a couple of things, you know, like in a, if you have like prairie garden, for example, um, you know, in larger prairie plantings, one of the reasons why they do burns during the summertime is because that does help to all of that, you know, dry dead matter. It helps to break it down so that it will, um, you know, return the nutrients back into the soil over time. And, you know, if you have a smaller, like I have native gardens in my yards and they're smaller and obviously I'm not burning them. So, um, you know, it, it's a little bit harder then because you're not continually recycling the nutrients back into your soil as it starts to get more mature. Um, you can use compost if you have like a backyard compost pile or backyard compost bin that you can kind of, you know, top dress it and get it in there or, you know, get it mixed in, especially in the early spring before plants get big and start coming up. Um, the moles love our native plants. <laughs> I have no suggestions for how to deal with moles. Um, I'm only laughing because this is a familiar thing that I hear from a lot of people that will say, well, I planted a prairie and now I have so many gophers. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's because you just made, um, that's like where prairies live or where gophers live is in a prairie. So um, you just made like a really great, go for habitat. Um, it, it does happen. I'm not, I don't really have suggestions for what to do about the moles. I guess I do have a less blurry picture though of what a paint by numbers garden would look like. Um, I mentioned that I could share Minnesota and Western Wisconsin native plant nurseries. You can find this on the um, Wild Ones Twin Cities website, they have this downloadable as a PDF, but there's a lot if you're in this part of, you know, this little part of the world here, we're actually very lucky to have a lot of native plant retailers. And a few of them are, I mean, there's like the old originals, Outback Nursery down in Hastings and Landscape Alternatives and Schaefer, they were both started back in the early 80s. And 
Uh, these guys are like the pioneers in native plant landscaping. A lot of these other nurseries originally got their plants from the two of them and then have been propagating them over the years. So uh, we've got a lot of great expertise in this area. Um, just a couple of books and then I'll, you know, maybe close down and take more questions. I already mentioned Bringing Nature Home from Doug Tallamy. Um, then Heather Holm, she's got one that is pollinators of native plants. And, you know, this is one to help identify what these different kinds of bees and butterflies and moths and things are that you're finding. And then she has another one that's specifically about bees. And um, in this one, she looks at different plant species and what all the different kinds of bees are that, you know, if you plant this, which species of bees can you expect to find as a result? So I, I just think it's really fun because, um, you know, I'll look at the one plant and I'll go, wow, there's 12 different kinds of bees that I might see on this plant. Um, if you're really into bees and pollinators, just wanted to share a couple of other organizations and resources, the Bee Lab at University of Minnesota, Pollinator Friendly Alliance, in the Stillwater area, there's a honeybee club. So if you are raising bees in your backyard, there are actually a lot of other people in the area who are as well. Um, and then Xerxes Society has information about all kinds of insects, not just pollinators. Um, and then Monarchs in particular, Monarch Joint Venture and um, Fish and Wildlife Service Save the Monarch have a lot of great resources for monarchs as well, and including how to get involved if you have like a group of youth or a group of kids that you want to do monarch um, monarch tracking with. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and see what other kinds of questions you might have. And I might even just stop the share so that I can see people's faces. <clears throat> Ha 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 ha. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> like, Carrie, Carrie was hoping to find similar resources in Tennessee and the phone complied. Yes. I know my friends and I have been trying to figure that out for the longest time. Like, are our phones spying on us? Are they listening to us? We, we, we even for a while, we had an experiment where we would talk about things that we wouldn't normally talk about, like monster truck rallies, you know, just to see if, um, if ads would start showing up the next day for these things that we would never have Googled on our own. And <laughs> we, we never could quite decide if that was what was happening or not. <clears throat> well, I'm glad that the phone was listening in a helpful way today. <laughs> what other have, kinds? Of sorry, oh, Angie. Yeah, we do have some a few extra minutes if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask Angie, but thank you so much just for a very timely and informative presentation today too. I know um, I always get eager to get outside and do some yard work. And so this definitely makes me rethink the process and think about what plants and flowers we'll be planting for this year as well. Yeah. Um, what is a common mistake that people make when they step into this exciting hobby? Um, I think, I don't know if this is a mistake per se, but you know, trying to trying to do too much at once <laughs> can, um, you know, a lot of times it's like you get so excited and you're like, wow, I'm just gonna take out my entire yard and make it all into native plants. And you certainly can do that. Um, it depends on if you have a job and if you have a kid and if you have, you know, like how many other obligations you have in life because the first three years of getting a native plant um, I mean, the planting established are going to be the hardest. And I found like in my own yard, it took about 10 years. I did get to the point where we've, we've got rid of almost all, you know, we have a little bit of yard in our backyard, but we got rid of all of the lawn in the front yard and on the side yard. Um, it, you know, it, we did it little by little. It was like each year I'd take one thing. Like, okay. This year, the boulevard strip is getting, it's getting on. And for me, I started with the most inconvenient to mow places first. Like I used to have this little skinny strip between the edge of the driveway and the fence and I couldn't even fit the lawnmower there. So that was, that was dumb. I just got rid of that grass and made it into flowers. Um, same thing with that boulevard strip between the sidewalk and the road. I didn't want to mow that. So I think zooming a little by little 
will generally make you happier than if you try to do it all at once. Um, the only exception being if you have a large property, if you're going to, you know, convert three acres to prairie, then you really should just do it all at once. Um, I think the other thing is keep in mind that a native planting, I think even more so than like our horticultural, traditional horticultural gardens will change over time. It will not look the same in year five as it did in year three, and it won't look the same in year 10 as it did in year five, because the plants will gradually start moving around within your garden. And um, some things will, some things will be winners, some things will be losers. And I think you just need to kind of accept that reality that that's the way it's going to be that um, you can, you know, you can create like a really nice design in the beginning. And if you're very dedicated, you might be able to maintain that. But um, in my experience, the gardens change over time. And, you know, that's just because their nature, their nature is always changing too. So it's going to be different than when you're just planting petunias and peonies. Um, how do you assess the benefit of removing already established flowers and trees that aren't native to make space for natives? Um, so I think that if, so I'm not a purist. I know that some people feel like, oh, it's going to all be native. I'm not a purist. And there are some non-native things that I have in my yard that I've either kept because I think they're pretty or, um, you know, like I've got tulips that I put up just so we have some color that comes up in the spring and they're not really bothering anything. Um, if you have anything that was invasive, obviously get rid of that. Um, I think some of the like lower value things that I can think of, like there's a lot of these coniferous shrubs that people put in their yards that don't really they don't really add much value. I mean, they, they're kind of a placeholder, but they, they don't really provide much value. So those would be ones that you might consider slowly swapping out with native shrubs. Um, you know, if you've got flower beds, you know, maybe considering interspersing so that, you know, you might have a little of, a little of both in there. You could have um, some, of the, some of the native and some of the non-native doing, you know, doing it little by little and, I still, like I said, I, I have things like I've got the peonies. I still have the peonies because I love them. And, you know, the tulips are nice for the really early spring color. So I think it's okay to, to keep some in there as long as it's not causing any problems. What else? Everybody's ready to go out for a walk, eh? The sun's shining. <laughs> well, it, it is almost one o'clock. Yeah. Um, in the chat, I did throw in a message. So there is a short survey that if you wouldn't mind completing that, that's always helpful for us to learn more about what we can do uh, during our lunch and learns. And then just a note too, um, we do have another lunch and learn scheduled for April 13th on mussels of the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway. So there is a registration link available for you as well. So um, thank you again, Angie, for joining us today. And thank you to the more than 30 participants that uh, attended this lunch and learn as well. We hope that you found the information to be value valuable and useful.